Okay, so uh, sorry for beginning a little bit late uh, because of a couple of technical issues. People have problems with uh, Max. I had problems with uh, other environments as well. Uh, so uh, I see a lot of people gathered here compared to other sessions. Perhaps I don't know, but usually authentication is a topic that everybody cares about, but when there is a presentation about such a topic, nobody actually goes to that. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. I, it's not exactly my first presentation about authentication. I know a couple of faces that I have seen already. Like, I've seen you, I think so, at some point, uh, doing some uh, authentication-related stuff. But it's hard to gather people around the topic. So, uh, a couple of words regarding myself. Uh, my name is Michael Paquier. I'm French, as you may have noticed already. Uh, and based in Tokyo, uh, where I am working for VMware and PostgreSQL. So I'm working on Postgres itself since 2009. Uh, and I did, uh, at the beginning of Postgres, a couple of uh, small patches for the community. And I did also some multi-master related work in something which was called Postgres XE that we, you may have heard about or not, which was one of the first, uh, so said, scaling out multi-master solutions, or at least an architecture which has inspired a lot of uh, solutions that we have now those days, like Postgres XL is based on that, you have Citus, and uh, you had also Greenplan also before that as well. Uh, so what I'm doing mainly is I'm doing packaging, integration of Postgres, development of solutions, and also uh, customer support. When things uh, heat up, uh, you need somebody who actually knows Postgres, needs to come in and just say, okay, no, that's not correct, or we have such a problem, or anything like that. So I'm doing like a range variety of things regarding PostgreSQL. Uh, and we are a very large company, so we integrate Postgres in many, many products. Sometimes in things that I have no idea about because people just use Postgres because it's open source, it's licenses BSE, you just integrate it, you don't have any license pro problems or anything like that. So today is about authentication methods and PostgreSQL shines in this area with the variety of options that it offers to people uh, to be able to use authentication, which is basically, how do I want to connect to my PostgreSQL instance? What kind of uh, constraints, or what kind of, in what kind of environment, what kind of property am I ready to accept to do uh, password or some kind of authentications? You have a set of families of authentications, for example, passwords, uh, things like what is called certificates, uh, and other things like Kerberos, GSS, uh, GSS API, SS API, and also other, other things. Uh, all of those authentication methods are directly listed uh, within the documentation in itself, where you can find details about how to use them, and I'm basically going into a little bit more in depth to those things regarding what you can do, how you can use them, and also uh, what PostgreSQL has to offer lately in terms of new options when it comes to authentication. So this is like this track is part of the new features or anything like that. So I'm just going to go a little bit through uh, everything in the code source. PostgreSQL code tree is very well structured, structured. And when you are looking for anything regarding authentication or uh, protocol between the client and the back end, you have a set of files that you need to look at, or you should look at if you are interested at patching them or just having a look at how PostgreSQL is behaving uh, in that. So you have authentication.c, uh, authentication scram.c in a backend related uh, path called src slash backend slash libpq. 
Uh, and also you have a front-end implementation which speaks the PostgreSQL protocol on the LPQ side within SRC interfaces LPQ. And a set of files uh, which are used for authentication as well as, uh, I would say, communication, direct communica communication between the client and the front-end uh, when it comes to uh, several layers of uh, communication transport, like you may, for example, have SSL, something which is not using SSL or anything, or this abstraction layer is also uh, part of those uh, set of files. So the code is well commented and also well structured. So if you, have a, if you take a couple of hours and try to have a look within that, you can really have a good understanding of what PostgreSQL does and why it actually does it this way. So, when it comes to authentication, you have a set of configuration files that PostgreSQL ships, which you can use to define policies related to authentication itself. When a client connects to PostgreSQL, what it does first is send uh, what is called a startup process, a uh, startup uh, packet, which includes basically the username and the database name that it wants to use. Uh, you have a couple of other things uh, also as well, but just to keep it simple, you have that. So what pghba.conf does is define a set of, uh, an, of uh, administration policies that you can define which map to this information depending on also uh, the location that the user uses to connect to the instance. For example, is the user using a uh, local uh, Unix socket path, or is it using a given IP, or anything like that. So you can filter things and define policies based on the user, the database, the host, also using uh, filtering rules, uh, for example, using the slash, uh, I'm not very good at that, uh, slash 32 bits, or slash 28 bits, or anything like that, to be able to filter IPs directly uh, on that. Yeah, and you have also the type of policy that you would like to include, which is in this case, type means for this user coming from this IP, what kind of authentication me method does I want to let the client use when it comes to that. So it controls basically uh, authentication and connection policies. Usually people also have always on top of that other things like firewall uh, that they use. And uh, PostgreSQL also has a set of settings which can be used to also control that a little bit more on top of it. Uh, there is one parameter called uh, listen underscore addresses, which defines uh, at which uh, IP addresses PostgreSQL is listening to. Uh, by default, I don't remember the default value. Of, uh, you remember the default value? Localhost. Localhost and, oh yeah, uh, it's, it should be colon colon one for IPv6 and uh, one to uh, even though no, not localhost. I think localhost is also to those two. To the lo local Unix, uh, so, uh, slash TMP perhaps, right? By default. In any case, it's not star, so. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not star. So, uh, which is also something that I would like to point out is that this addresses can be also set up to a star, which means a star, which means that PostgreSQL listens to any kind of IPs, which is an option that you actually should not use because that's, that just allows everything to come in. Uh, so uh, the things defined in, uh, within pghba.conf are order dependent, which is that the first match for user, database, and host wins. And you have a look at the authentication method based on the matches done. So you need to put the most specific policy first in the list, and then you just loosen it a little bit more each time. And so you have listen addresses as well. Uh, you also have another file called pghidden.conf, which is used for username mapping. For certain authentication methods, you can have uh, the, data, the, the OS user or the user which is associated to the authentication framework that you are using, which does not exactly map what is inside the database itself. So you can use uh, this file 
to define uh, mapping policies, which is very useful, for example, for things like uh, Kerberos, GSS API, or peer connections. And also something which is very cool, I think, is that it supports uh, regular expression, such as you can define, you don't have to define one rule for each user, but you can have a mapping, I would say, an expression which maps to uh, something. For example, you have a user with a prefix and a suffix, and you could use a matching using the prefix, the, the suffix, within, in between the username to be able to do uh, more simple database usernames within the system of PostgreSQL itself. Uh, you have uh, for each entry in pgispa.conf a parameter called map equals something and the mapping defined in, in that is actually the mapping that you find back in the pgident.conf. Uh, you have also something which is, uh, I find myself uh, useful when it comes to clients called pgservice.conf, uh, which is something that you can use to centralize connection parameters for clients. And you have, uh, for the client point of view, an environment variable called pg service file, and, but you do not have a connection parameter to control that. For example, you have the same kind of facilities for the password file which has an environment variable and since Postgres 9.6, also a connection, or, or 10, 9.6 or 10, I don't remember exactly, a connection parameter which can be used for the password file as well. So you can, for example, use that uh, to say to a local service, to uh, a service which connects automatically to Postgres, that I have, I am this service and this service automatically is able to use uh, this configuration file to say, okay, I'm going to connect to this host, this port, and as this user. For example, for a given product that I have and that I have to maintain, I have PostgreSQL running in a given box, and I have also running inside that an archiver, which is based on the PG uh, receive while, and I basically use that to be able to connect automatically to Postgres because the customer is also able to uh, customize a little bit the options used by Postgres, like the port use of the, uh, for the instance. So if the customer decides to deploy PostgreSQL not running on 5432, but on another port, you need to update that and to make sure that it works correctly. So you can use that combined with a static uh, service file, uh, which is uh, like for the thing that I have here, it's a custom uh, service management uh, solution that has been developed internally. But if you use something like systemd or anything like that, which is based on a set of static definitions, you could always try to rely on that, which has more dynamic data depending on the context. So uh, in all versions that I know of, like when has been introduced the service file like down to seven point, uh, like. So you have it in all the versions supported by the community. So it really depends on what kind of solutions you are going to integrate, but uh, that's also something which is very useful uh, to know when it comes to uh, the kind of constraints you are ready to accept and the flexibility that you want to have depending on what you try to do. So I'm going to go through a little bit, uh, I'm going to go a little bit more into the details of authentication methods used in Postgres itself. So the first one is called trust. I trust everybody to connect to the, to the instance, which means that you basically have use cases for them, which are like your own development or anything like that, and this is the kind of option that you never want to use for a PostgreSQL instance. Uh, you have on the net a lot of instances at given IPs that show up as listening at the port that PostgreSQL uses by default, and you can actually connect to them. I'm pretty sure that they are using this trust uh, method as well. So you basically never want to use that. You allow people to come in, like anybody, from anywhere, without any control at all. So you 
may want to use that for personal development if you want just to not uh, have, if you want to keep your uh, own development scripts a little bit more simple or anything like that. But that's basically not something that you want to use uh, in any other real environments. After that comes a set of uh, password related method, methods. The first one is called uh, password uh, within the pghba.conf which is basically the client sending uh, to the server the password in, in clear text, plain text. So the server just asks uh, from the client, oh, do you have the password? The client says, yes, this is my set of bytes. For, for example, my password is, in this case, Hoge. He sends directly, Hoge. And the server sends, uh, says back to the client, OK, you are good to go. That's the good password. Uh, if you use that, uh, you shouldn't use it to begin with, and you most likely want to use SSL uh, with it, such as you do not have anybody looking at your connections and be able to see the password directly uh, in clear text. So uh, this is weak to uh, password sniffing and of course across the network. Uh, a couple of months back I mentioned on the mailing list that well, you can have trusted ne networks, and somebody just answering me, this concept does not even exist. So you should really uh, try use SSL in this case if you use that, which is something that you actually should not uh, use, I imagine. But sometimes you don't actually have the choice. Uh, another thing which comes uh, is MD5. Uh, you, in this case, the password is not sent directly as clear text, but it's sent as, as a hash using uh, the formula that's written in gray on the second line, which is MD5 of the MD5 of password plus username uh, using a uh, four byte sort, which gives uh, four billion possibilities uh, to be able to try to guess what basically this hash um, has been. So in this case, the server says, OK, here is a four byte random uh, set of bytes. He sends back to the client who says, OK, so I'm going to compute that. And then what the server does is to compare both of them. And if there is a match, the server sa says back, OK, you are good to go and you are good to connect. Again, you most likely want to use uh, SSL uh, in this case because uh, it's possible to, like MD5 is very cheap to like the ship to compile uh, md5 hashes and even on a normal laptop you can have per second millions of md5 hashes to be able to compile and you have on top of that basically only four bytes of a sort which allow for randomness to happen and other things are that you can see that uh, the md5 hash of the password and the username is being used so if you do uh, or if you have a uh, uh, role uh, rotation which needs to happen and you need to roll to rename a role what basically happens is that if the password is in md5 hash format within postgresql itself you need to drop it and you need to recreate it once again you can set up uh, a parameter called the password underscore encryption to md5 to be able to set to decide uh, if a password created is used uh, using MD5 in this case. This also applies to other types of hashes. PostgreSQL uh, 10 has dropped support in PG authentication ID for uh, clear text passwords. It was possible to get that uh, to support to get that inside PG authentication ID, but this has been dropped. So regarding uh, the MD5 hash, uh, you can do a couple of things with that, like a guess attack, which is, uh, as the hash calculation is very, very fast, you can very quickly, at least on modern machines, be able to get back or to be able to guess what the hash looks at. Uh, you have also something called uh, the pass the hash. You can basically patch libpq and you don't actually need to know the password, uh, the raw password if you want to trick that. You just need to know the hash itself. So for example, even if you store uh, MD5 hashed passwords inside PG authentication ID and somebody, for example, steals 
and all backup and just have the hash, they can just reuse that to be able to connect back to PostgreSQL. So you need to be very careful regarding your old backup policy, say you have uh, an old hard disk with a very, very old uh, password inside it and somebody just threw it away and somebody like an attacker just gets it, is able to get back uh, to have a look at the backup data, which is why the, in this case, uh, the interesting part is the uh, on disk data, which is inside PG authentication ID, get back the hash and be able to use that to connect back to a PostgreSQL instance. And then comes uh, something which is new in PostgreSQL uh, 10, uh, which has been uh, combined efforts uh, between uh, Heike Lina and uh, a committer of PostgreSQL and uh, myself. Uh, this has taken a couple of years to get into the PostgreSQL co core code. But we have a new authentication method, which is a password-based method called scrum dash SHA-256. And in this case, it's way more advanced and way more complicated than MD5 and has strong properties that we can rely on to improve the security of PostgreSQL. So that's basically, compared to MD5 or to even the password uh, method, what happened before is that the client just sent the password and then the server just said, okay, you are going to connect or anything like that. So a client could easily be tricked by an attacker who connects to a given instance and say, okay, you are good to connect and good to go, but actually the server does not know uh, the password that has been used. As it just needs to say back to uh, the client that, okay, you are good to connect. But in this case, uh, what happens is that not only uh, the client prove, proves to the server that it knows the password, but the server also sends back to the client a proof that it itself knows the password which makes a huge uh, change because, for example, if you try to use uh, Scrum authentication, you connect using a client to an attacker and your server not only tells you that you can connect back to it, but also it tells you if it actually knows the password or not. And if the proof that the server sends back is actually not something that the client expects, you can say, hmm, something is weird. So the client can just, just actually re reject the connection. So this is also a strong property of uh, this uh, protocol. You have uh, also um, more properties rega regarding that. Uh, replay attacks are way harder than that, than MD5, for example, because, for example, for MD5, we have a random uh, sort, which is four bytes. Uh, in the case of um, Scrum, not only do we have uh, non-scenes which are uh, 18 bytes long, if I recall correctly, uh, but you can also uh, decide for a given uh, password ver verifier hashed with hash, the length of the random uh, key used during the, computer, the, during the proof of the computation. So, um, not going into details that, I forgot a lot of details on that myself. Uh, but replay attacks become way, way harder. The downside of that is that it takes also time to be able to compute uh, proofs for the client and the server. So if you take the default parameters, even on modern mati machines, you actually do not notice any downtime when you try to do the connection. But uh, it it is by design a little bit slower as well. So you take advantage of that on the security side and on the performance side, you also uh, have uh, some, perhaps, uh, some slowdowns, but usually those are not really noticeable. Uh, Scrum is designed to uh, prevent also middleware attacks. So uh, if you have something, uh, I think that PG Bouncer is not able to support Scrum, and uh, you, there is another solution called the PG pool. Uh, who knows about PG pool? A couple of people. So PG pool takes advantages of the weaknesses of MD5 to be able to connect and to work as a middleware. And Scrum is designed to prevent those kind of uh, behaviors and attacks. So I believe that uh, PG pool does not have yet support for the Scrum authentication as well. Uh, even if Scrum is used, I'm pretty sure that you still want to use uh, SSL 
uh, because you have on top of that a couple of extra checks that you can rely on and use uh, for security purposes. So when it comes to the HPA conf configuration file and password-based authentications, you have a set of uh, keywords that you can specify directly in the pghpa.conf file. And those do not completely behave uh, in a consistent way uh, with what you would actually expect. So uh, this is a summary of what actually happens. So you have, in this case, the verifier type, which is, is my password hashed within the catalog table PG authentication ID using MD5 or using Scrum? And how does it work when I have in pghpa.conf something like a password MD5 or Scrum? So if you have a password from the client point of view, you still, send, you still have the client sending uh, the hash, uh, not the hash, the password in clear text. But what happens on the server side is that the server by itself compiles uh, a verifier or MD5 hash and is able to check if uh, the connection is able to do. So even if you have created a user which is using an MD5 hash password, a Scrum hash password, and you uh, define a password uh, entry in hpa.conf, you are still able to connect. MD5 behaves a little bit differently if you have an MD5 hash and you use MD5. So you are going to use the MD5 authentication protocol, which is the exchange of the four bytes uh, random sort and then the computation happening on the client, which is sent back to the server. Uh, if you have a user using a Scrum, based hash, what actually happens behind the hood is that you use the Scrum authentication. And you have also an extra entry called the Scrum-SHA-256, which is not compatible with MD5, but using Scrum. So uh, when you define the verifier type, which is MD5 or Scrum, and you, use, you have a password stored using the Scrum uh, verifier, you actually use uh, the Scrum authentication as well. Uh, in PostgreSQL 11 comes a new feature which is called uh, channel binding, uh, which is a feature that I have been working on uh, for this feature, for this uh, release especially, PostgreSQL 11, and will be uh, normally available uh, for the next major release if everything goes fine. Uh, Peter, who is here also, here, uh, has uh, reviewed the patch and uh, committed the patch uh, as well. So what uh, Scrum Channel Binding is doing is a, an extra, it's adding some extra logic to be able to do a man-in-the-middle attack prevention. A man-in-the-middle attack would be a client connecting to a given instance, and while you are still doing uh, the connection, you have an attacker just swapping the connection and just stealing it, more or less. And what you actually do for those checks is that you actually bind the front end and the back end, and you make sure that once you begin a connection to a given point, you are still connected to the same point when you do go more in depth into the authentication protocol. So uh, this is not something invented. This is something that has been defined, uh, defined using a given RFC, and you have a set of channel bindings also available with that. And so really the concept is that you make sure that you connect somewhere and you still are really using the same connection using that. Uh, you have uh, three channel binding types. PostgreSQL implements two of them. Uh, the default one is called TLS unique. And you basically make sure that a specific connection is being used. Uh, the set of uh, data bytes exchanged between the client and the server regarding channel binding is actually some extra data in the set of messages ex uh, used for the um, uh, Scrum exchange that you, you could see a couple of slides uh, before. So what basically happens is that the client compiles this data, sends it to uh, the server, which compares it and makes sure that there is no uh, conflict with that. You have also a double check, which is that the server uses back the data that it compiled and also includes that in the final proof that the client uses to make sure that the server not only knows the password, but also knows the exact uh, binding data as well. And you have also something which is called endpoints, meaning that the endpoint you are connected to is still the same, which uses as uh, binding data, a hash of the 
server uh, certificates. So when it comes to channel binding, SSL is a requirement. OpenSSL comes with a set of APIs which allow uh, clients, and in this case PostgreSQL on the libpq, or even the server side to be able to get uh, this channel binding data and to be able to compile it. And you can directly use that within the protocol itself to make sure that uh, what you have is consistent on both sides. So uh, as I mentioned before, it's added in PostgreSQL 11. You have two channel binding types, which one called TLS unique, and a second one called TLS server endpoints. Uh, OpenSSL has support for it. Uh, the documentation of OpenSSL is horrible. So uh, when you try to look for support of that, what you finish to do is by having a look at the code of OpenSSL itself and try to actually find what works, how it works, and you need really to do a lot of guess of what happens. So most of the work, investigation and work of that was actually to figure out how OpenSSL defines that and what kind of somewhat undocumented generic API is available to be able to use that. Another good news is that you have uh, other uh, SSL implementations, like for example, GNU TLS, which actually documents the fact that it supports TLS unique, which is actually a little bit better. Uh, PostgreSQL still uh, has the infrastructure to support multiple SSL implementations. In 11, we still have only OpenSSL, but I'm hopeful with the fact that we are going to have new uh, SSL implementations as well in PostgreSQL, which would basically be defined at uh, compile, uh, compile time, I would imagine. Uh, you have also other SSL implementations. For example, macOS has its own uh, idea of how SSL works, which is, Daniel worked on that. What, what was it exactly, the, the name of that? Yeah, yeah, you cannot get the end message, but what, what's the name actually of the implementation? Oh, Sorry? Se yeah, se secure transport. Thank you. And you have also Windows se secure transport. So uh, Daniel, who is here, has written a patch uh, to be able to add uh, Mac OS secure transport implementation in PostgreSQL itself, which didn't get into 11. And you are going to send a new patch. I rebased it to <laughs> <But>, Really? <laughs> So you, we may have that. Really? Oh, actually, that's a good news. Uh, good thing that this has been pushed uh, as well. Uh, like I didn't know that it was possible. Uh, okay, that's good to know. And also, you have Windows. So regarding Windows, I have no idea if, if you could be able to use uh, any of the channel binding types. If you are interested in Windows and you would like to get a new more native implementation of Postgres, because now PostgreSQL is shipped with OpenSSL with a set of uh, hard dependencies. For example, ADB stuff has uh, the uh, OpenSSL DDL, I'm pretty sure, embedded inside it to make sure that things work correctly. And you may, if you want to remove this dependency, you may be interested in actually work on that. Uh, let's be clear, I am not interested in doing that. But if you are interested, you're welcome to do so. Uh, and I try to have a look at the patch uh, if uh, possible. So uh, there is a connection parameter which allows to control what kind of channel binding type is being used. Uh, as things stand on the master branch, uh, you can disable it if you use an empty value, and you can also define the channel binding type uh, which is used for the connection. So. The default is TLS unique. I'm pretty sure that you only want to rely only on the default. Uh, the only reason why we implemented uh, the endpoint one was for the, uh, was for the JDBC, Postgres JDBC people, because they use directly the PostgreSQL protocol. And they actually, we had some discussions that TLS unique is really a pain to get back, but you have a couple of APIs which would, could allow you to get more easily a hash of the server certificate. So we finished implementing that as well, basically for this reason, and now we actually have a second reason, which is the macOS uh, implementation of SSL, which could actually use it. So it was actually a good idea to get that. Uh, we are still working on that stuff, uh, because as things stand correctly, uh, libpq is not able to protect itself from what is called a downgrade attack. For example, the client may want uh, to do a Scrum authentication uh, with the server, 
uh, using channel binding and using a bunch of secure options. But uh, any attacker can actually forcibly force the client to use uh, another type of authentication. For example, if the client wants to use clear text to such as it's able to steal the password, you could have the, the client expecting to do scrum. The server sends back uh, a reply to say, oh, I actually want to do clear text. And the client would transparently do a clear text. Uh, this is the kind of problem that already existed in uh, Postgres like for many, many years. Uh, but we are working on that, such as you have a mechanism which allow to prevent that and which allow you to do uh, man-in-the-middle attack prevention in a secure way for uh, LibPQ. If you are using a driver which is speaking directly to the, pro the protocol, you may want something rather similar to that. And of course, as this involves protocol changes, if you have something which depends directly on LibPQ, you don't need to do anything. But if you use something like JDBC, uh, NPGSQ, NPGSQL, the native clients that you can use on Windows like uh, PS, PSQL, right? Which speak directly the PostgreSQL protocol, you need to have support on that. So uh, JDBC and uh, NPGSQL, NPGSQL have added support for uh, Scrum. Uh, channel binding is a new thing, so you will need to wait for channel binding support on their side as well regarding that. Uh, the protocol has been made extensible, so it can work but just some work is needed there. Which brings something kind of interesting is that imagine that you, I'm not giving a precise example, but imagine that you work on a large product in a large co corporation with PostgreSQL being only a small part of a huge thing and you have something like uh, 15 to 20 teams working on different portions of that with things embedded in Java, or sometimes you have Windows being used Mainly it's on Linux. And each piece is using, for example, its own copy of JDBC, its own copy of a given driver. If you depend on LibPQ directly, you may be lucky and you may be able to link to a version of LibPQ which has support for Scrum or channel binding. But trying to get people to upgrade something and to make sure that everything is consistent and that, that the protocol supports everything can be a pain when it, when it comes to a large scale corporation or anything like that. I'm not giving any examples. But you need to be very, very careful with your application stack and to be sure that the latest version of the driver is available, such as you have protocol support for Scrum if you are willing to use it. If you try, for example, to use uh, Scrum authentication using uh, JDBC version, which is older than, uh, I don't remember the exact version. Sorry? Oh, yeah, you are, you are here, so you know. Which one? Yeah, what, what you get is basically uh, an error, if I recall correctly, like JDBC does not support authentication method with a strange integer, integer number. So if you use things like ODBC or PsychoPG2, you're actually lucky because it depends actually on LibPQ and LibPQ. If linked with a version of uh, LibPQ uh, of PostgreSQL 10 or newer, which may not be always the case, you are actually somewhat lucky you would be able to do that. So be careful about your application stack when it comes to integration of solution, what kind of things you want to use, and what kind of constraints you are already living with. Uh, there is a wiki page about the state of the drivers of PostgreSQL, which works directly with LibPQ or speak directly to the protocol level. So you can always try to refer to that about the state of things. And if you are using something, how you should try to do an upgrade. Uh, you have also, I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure that I'm going to run out of time. What time is it? You're kidding me. Uh, so we have a peer authentication, which is uh, useful for local connections. Uh, no windows here, you can just use uh, local Unix socket connections. And it's actually a cool thing that, like I really like this thing a lot because it relies on the OS kernel uh, call called get, get peer EID and I also use it uh, for what I mentioned before, the local while archiving service uh, so, so as you actually can have a secure connection to PostgreSQL without, without really relying on trust. Uh, you have also other things like uh, LDAP uh, are a lot of people using LDAP here? 
So uh, LDAP is really cool for uh, large organizations because you can centralize uh, password policy. Uh, for example, uh, login failures, uh, password, uh, password rotation, which are the kind of class of policies that PostgreSQL is very bad at. To be able to uh, manage users and passwords. So if, we, if, you, if, for example, you have a set of users centralized in one place, you can just rely on it, and PostgreSQL has great support for uh, LDAP. So it's a server-side implementation, meaning that seen from the client, you actually use uh, a clear text password, which is sent back to, from the client. And from the client, it's not LDAP, it's only clear text. It's seen like a password authentication. Uh, you have a couple of um, modes supported, which is prefix and suffix, or the, the simple bind mode, which is that you basically just send a uh, username, you check for a match of it, or you have the search plus, plus bind mode, which does a couple of extra round trips to the LDAP server, such as you first search for an entry, and then you bind it uh, to, for the authentication. Uh, be careful that you should use SSL between the client and Postgres itself, and also have PostgreSQL use SSL between the server itself and the LDAP instance. Uh, you have a couple of extra features available uh, for LDAP, which have been implemented by Thomas Penrose during another session uh, in, uh, in another room now, uh, like the addition of uh, LDAPS and the addition also of a new uh, search filter, which is way more flexible than uh, the existing uh, LDAP uh, search attributes, because you can do a lookup using multiple attributes at the same time. Uh, things that have been also committed by Peter, right? Oh, no, yeah. Some of that, not everything? You did LDAP, yes. No, oh, <laughs> uh, so Peter basically committed uh, those features as well. <laughs> Uh, you have also Kerberos, uh, which is uh, useful in some cases because you don't have no uh, actual password prompt. Uh, and if you use it, really uh, use the username mapping file, uh, pgident.conf, such that you can do a more flexible management of your users on the database side. And again, you should use uh, SSL. Uh, there is a patch pending uh, which supports, which would allow to support GSS API encryption at a very low communication level within PostgreSQL. So the patch was submitted for Postgres 10, and I actually have been very surprised to see that uh, the person who worked on that has sent a new patch version for the next commit fest, like one or two weeks ago. So you, we may get support for that uh, as well. So there are a couple of low level complications which make this patch very, very complicated, but I'm actually looking forward to seeing that and to have a look at it uh, myself. Uh, you have also certificates, which require uh, SSL, and actually you don't need to use any password at all. And you use uh, within the certificates the CN field to do a matching between uh, what is within the certificate itself and the database user. So once again, you can use the user mapping uh, file and the client needs to have a trusted certificate. So you have an, an option called client cert in pghba.conf, which is enforced in this case. Uh, there have been some documentation improvements regarding the use of intermediate certificates uh, using options like uh, v v3 underscore CA, uh, which allow you to improve uh, basically uh, the life cycle of uh, LIF certificates. And PostgreSQL has also nice improvements in this area that have been given done by uh, Bruce Wombian, who is also doing another talk, at the, perhaps they finished already, uh, about that. So really, the Postgres talks are kind of good uh, for that. Regarding su super users, uh, just no. Don't use them, never use them. If you need to use them, think twice about them. Uh, Postgres 9.6 has added a facility which allows you to control uh, access uh, control to given functions for uh, system uh, functions, which is very actually useful for things like uh, PG Rewind and in Postgres 11, PG Rewind, if you don't know about it, just come later if you are interested in that, I can give you a full talk about that. Uh, I've been working on that a lot. 
which would allow PG1 to work without any superuser needs. And we have also a set of system rules which allow a set of uh, kind of superuser actions, but only a subset of them. So you actually give only minimal uh, administration access to a specific set of users depending on your needs. Uh, you have other things like PAM or BSD. Uh, who uses PAM or BSD? Don't be shy. Skip. And then comes uh, something like I have been kind of noisy about SSL, SSL negotiation. So uh, the server sends options and the client actually decides what to do. And the client on the control on the client side, this is controlled by a parameter called SSL mode. So I found this uh, table uh, like I think a couple of years back, and I always kept that uh, around uh, on my own notes. I, I'm not actually sure who wrote that. It's not me. But it gives a really good summary about what kind of protection you get, depending on the, uh, this is not a verifier type, this is uh, an SSL mode value, because you have a set of values, and what kind of protections you can expect if you use uh, different kinds of things. Usually what people recommend is that prefer is the default, which is an extremely bad idea. You most likely want to rely on verify CA or verify full, which adds on top of the requirement to have an SSL connection. You need to have uh, the client provide a certificate authentication file, which is valid regarding what, is, what has been loaded by the server. Uh, you can refer back to the docs regarding that. Uh, regarding tests, uh, we have a bunch of uh, new tests. Most of them implemented uh, by Peter, who is here also as well for Kerberos and LDAP. And if you are doing any kind of development for any new features for LDAP, Kerberos, SSL, or authentication, you usually want to have tests. We really want tests. We want coverage to be sure that nothing is broken or nothing gets broken in the future. And this is the kind of areas that you should look at if you are planning to, of course, to send a patch, right? Because you have a lot of ideas and you have a lot of time and you are going to send a lot of patches. So I'm, of course, over time because we began late. Uh, are there any questions? I don't know if I have time. Uh, everybody is hungry. Everybody looks tired. I know it's not the most interesting topic ever. But if you have any questions, feel free to catch me later on. Uh, and I try to answer them as much as I can. Okay, thank you.